Hi guys, I'm Shmi, hello, and welcome back to the channel where today we're heading through to Bantu. No, but we are gonna get to that and explain all very shortly. So today is basically a day in my life with a supercar garage because things have been a little bit of a curveball the last few days. You know, of course, that we took the Zenvo over to London Heathrow Airport. It was about here. It's now on its way to America. I should actually right now be in California, but the car was delayed and we're gonna explain that story as well. Plus, given we're still here, there are a few, let's say, maintenance things that we need to do, some updates with the 1M, a couple of cars that need to go out, because as I often talk about, one of the things with cars and one of the reasons that everything is kept in proper running order is that we try and drive them all very regularly, and a few have been sitting still. So this is kind of an errand day vlog update explanation of next door, because I know people still ask about that all of the time, and the full story of why the Zenvo isn't yet ready for car week. Well, I wasn't quite ready for today's sunshine, but you'll remember we used to walk out, walk up this way, past the Skoda, which of course we came back with from Heathrow, the other that we've recently shown, and up this way is the back half of the barn. We're not actually gonna go there today, we're gonna stay here, and you're gonna know why a little bit later on. I have explained it a few times, but I wanna to get to that in detail so you can understand it a little bit more. It's surprisingly a lovely day today, which given the weather we have had in the UK over the last month or two, yes, being British, we have to talk about it, is a very, very welcome change. In here, from the reception room, it's, it's really funny to think how normal that's become when not very long ago there was genuinely nothing there and we built the mezzanine, we've got the lounge with the privacy glass, the office is upstairs. We converted from cars in a barn on a farm to a dream man cave. So the Zenvo, which has temporarily been replaced by Brad's Abarth 124. The Zenvo we dropped off at Heathrow for a very complicated travel schedule. When you send cars to different countries, it's logistically complex. So the car was being transported by truck to Paris to take a flight from Charles de Gaulle all the way to the US, but oddly to land at Chicago O'Hare. Now, if you think about the geography of that, Chicago to Los Angeles is around 2000 miles. So we knew it was gonna have to land, clear customs, cause that's done much quicker when it's by an air freight, then be transported over three or four days to LA. Sadly, or frustratingly maybe I should say, the first flight it was supposed to catch didn't take off. For whatever reason, it just didn't manage to go anywhere. But I could see on the tracker, global telemetrics that I use for all of the cars, that it had been taken out of the warehouse in Paris and been taken to the apron, ready to go in the plane. So thinking about that being a little bit unusual, what's going on there. And by the way, this is a story that I have already explained over on the subscriptions on the Shmi 50 Instagram page. If you wanna get a heads up behind the scenes, that's the place to be. Day two, similar story, gets loaded, plane doesn't go. So what's, what's happened here? Fast forward, there's no flight the next day or the next day, and then it happens again. And it's like, this is really odd and starting to become a bit of a problem because it's gonna to get to Chicago, it's gonna be transported over, car week is coming up, there are lots of events, how's all this gonna to fit together? Well, the third plane then had the same issue. Thankfully, however, last night, because this video is being uploaded and recorded same day, straight to you guys live, last night it finally caught a plane. It is now, as I speak, in Chicago, being ready to be taken over to California, which will take three or four days, and I'm gonna fly out there a couple of days later than planned to meet and greet it, and then to go and drive to Malibu, to Beverly Hills, to Hollywood, up to Car Week with Fuel Run, all of the events up at Car Week. It's gonna be insane. It's gonna be so cool with that car in America, like I did with the Ford GT, like I've done with the GT Black Series, and like I've done with the Shelby GT500, who knows what's gonna be the next Schmimobile that does it. The fun thing though, because of this whole pushback of the trip, and I never really talk about the logistics behind all the videos and the travel and all of the cars, but you can imagine there's a lot of booking flights, rebooking flights, booking hotels, changing hotels, dates, new locations, last minute, things that aren't working. Cars often don't work as you want them to, and that means coming up with new plans, of course, new video plans. As soon as I get back, I've got a night at home, then I go somewhere, then I've got another night at home, and then it's gonna be Ford GT tour time. Yes, I'm taking the Ford GT on a road trip. That's all gonna be quite chaotic. Now, let's rewind back a bit, because one thing, obviously, I spoke about at length was, and showed, Barn 2. 
the second half of the barn behind the back wall, an area that sits kind of around a meter taller. So you couldn't just knock straight through the wall because the amount of space you'd use or lose, sorry, for a ramp that low cars like these would be able to drive up would take away so much space, it would be a foolish mistake. It would be cool to still be able to use the space. However, you probably figured Given that we're putting a workshop area over here, given it's not been on camera for about a year now, for nearly a year, there's probably a reason for that. There's probably a reason, and we're gonna to get to it shortly. I want to come over to the BMW 1M because we recently had an update, the first upgrade that I tried to install with Brad, the infotainment system, the wireless Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, to have a new nav system and reversing camera. And we ran into a small issue, if you saw that, with the way to fit the screen down on the dashboard and also how to best install the cable to the rear. Well, I had bought that system from Droid UK, who saw the video and basically said they could offer a solution that would make this work. So they came by to come and work on this uh, literally yesterday. So I am going to lower this down so I can show you the solution. Obviously to drop the Benpack Auto Stackers, first you go up, take them off the safety latches, lower them down, unlock the car to make sure the alarm doesn't go off. It is remarkably easy to do this, to get cars on, park them up, and obviously to then pull it down. Now I need to do a swap around of the plates on this car. I'm not gonna be doing that today, but that is, pretty much part of admin with these kind of things. Because this car sat in the trade for a while before, you actually have to physically send off the paperwork, which is always a little bit complicated, but we'll get that figured out. Anyway, that is now down. Um, I think I'm probably gonna have to start it and pull it off to show you this as best as possible. So let me do exactly that. Pull the car off the lift. We're probably on a charger, we are. So I should come around and unplug this first. We've got the O-rings and a more simple install in the back here with a quick connector. SeaTech Magic, always, always use those. Makes life very easy. But I'll start this up, pull it forwards, and then we'll be able to show you what we did. In here then, look at this. The screen now sits flush with the dashboard. The guys did the work for this in a matter of moments. We've got Android Auto, if you want that to load, obviously not at the moment. You've got the dashboard with the live information readout, your revs and whatever else you want out of it. You've got a whole host of different screens and things you can have, settings and all sorts. So this is really fun, great upgrade to the car, sitting in the place that the normal system would there on the dashboard. Now the reversing camera, to come and show you, has been installed right here. It looks OEM, it's on the boot release. But the thing we had a problem with was to install the cable, which we had awkwardly sitting from here under the trim, there. You will notice we now have it inside this grommet. It runs inside the original rubber piece, completely out the way, basically a small rewiring, job done, smooth, nice integration, very easy, great result, super happy with that. Simple, hey? Well, it sounds simple. So a big thanks to the Droid guys for coming down. If you need this kind of system, they have loads available. This generation one series, the F21s, all sorts of other models as well. I'll pop their link down below. Um, I'm really cool that despite having just bought it from them, they reached out and we got that settled up, sorted out. So cars need driving, cars need driving. Let me go look at my spreadsheet. Yeah, I have a spreadsheet that says when everything was last driven and we'll work out what's going out first. In terms of space in here for cars, which is of course why everybody wonders about the expansion and what we can do. We've got a few cars that aren't permanent, should we say in here. Brad's Abarth, we've got the MSRT Bright Pink Transit. We've got the Dub TVR, which we've just positioned behind at the moment. We've got Max's Jag. So if you imagine we've got those four spaces, there's another space just beyond here as well. If we were slightly more constructive with the layout, you could fit one more car there. So we've got a fifth space. There's one then under the 1M6, under all of these lifts, seven, eight, nine, ten, And then if you really wanted to, you can also fit a car or two quite neatly in the middle because things at the back don't move very often. So there are effectively 12 current free parking spaces here. I think we're good for a while. I think we're very good for a while. There will definitely be more projects akin to the Clio V6 and the 1M, but there's always gonna be a moving rotation, if you will. There are always gonna be cars that are in other places, the Zenvo, I should have included the Zenvo. So from my spaces, the Zenvo and the Focus RS are not here at the moment. So bring those back in, obviously a touch of space goes. 
you know the 296 GTS is imminent, the Pro Sangue is imminent, and I don't think anything's about to leave us from what's here right now. Anyway, you're, you're seeing me holding a key. We're talking America today a lot. We're gonna go for a slice of America with the GT500, which of course, I know it's cliche, but I love it. Press the button, and then this. Yes, that's good. It's not long until the dark horse, but the dark horse will be in the US. So I've actually got some things to sort out to do with that on this trip. It's really quite close. But let me get this unplugged. We've again got the SeaTech to the battery up front here. I think, no, I do need to pop the hood to be able to get that, which is driver side, passenger side. This is a very funny thing. It's really hard to remember where bonnet releases are. So I'm just gonna gamble 50-50. It's probably the other side. I haven't done this one too often. Is it the other side? Yeah, there we go. It's the other side. Oh, next time. <laughs> An interesting thing that happens now, as I pull the hood release, it stops the engine. It cuts the engine, because obviously if you've opened the bonnet, you're not about to be driving. So this is nice and easy. And we've got our beast of a V8 inside here. Check out that thing. And it's super easy with the charger. Literally again, just disconnect that. I don't know where I would be without these. Having the SeaTech CS ones that can work with any type of battery, that can work with any type of connection, that you just plug in, let them go. You do have to slam it that hard, it's horrible. But yeah, ready to pull this out and go for a short run. Every time I get into this car, it's straight into my mode, which I have configured to basically be noisy track setting, then open road. It's so ridiculous. This is a Mustang, and I'm losing my voice completely. This is a Mustang that is literally a beast. I mean, to think what they were able to do with this car and the performance that this thing offers. Remember, we've had it in the US, we've had tons of different trips. Driving it on Gumbel 3000 last year, Toronto to Miami, driving it coast to coast on the Where Shmi US tour. To now have it here, each time I take it out, it brings back all of those memories. Cars are about building the memories, having fun with them, enjoying them, driving them. And the fact that in this, it just has that ludicrous kick, yet it's still a Mustang. You know, it's still got all the creature comforts. We've still got Android Auto going on in here. We've still got some space. Admittedly, no back seats with the carbon fiber track pack, but plenty of space. We lugged the spare wheels all across the world with it, remember, in the back of this thing. Obviously, left-hand drive here in the UK, but kind of got used to that. And it's something that I find quite interesting with the 4GT and the Zenvo and the SLS and this all being left-hand drive, driving on the left side of the road, the wrong way round, if you will. It's just something that over time, you completely adapt to. Whether I'm driving a left-hand drive car here in England or a right-hand drive car in the US or in Germany or in somewhere else around Europe, it just becomes normal. It becomes something that you're comfortable with. You don't have to think twice about. You just hop in and go. Probably it's more distracting that in this car, the driver's door mirror that you have here has that super zoomed in mirror glass rather than the normal one that we would have that in the US would say objects in mirror closer than they appear because it has that slightly wider angle to it, which here means you have a bit of a blind spot over your left shoulder compared to what you're used to with that type of thing. But hey, to take this out, to go for a drive, and you know, I love coming out, just beautiful day, enjoying the cars, driving the cars, using them. So at the end of the day, that is what these things are for. So any opportunity to do, to take them through the paces and just to be reminded of it all is a whole lot of fun. And just to go for a, you know, a short loop. We are back, back on the lift. So, gonna go have a quick chill for a minute and then work out what we're doing next. Quick swap around. We're gonna head out now with the Hurricane STO. Now, I recently did a reel, a short form piece of content with this car showing you that the way you plug it in to the SeaTech is in the front clamshell, the Cofango, which you pop open from both sides, it pivots forwards, and then in here, it's a bit of a, a fiddle, I'm not gonna lie. Now, I think in newer STOs, they have a cigarette socket that works for the charger. In this car, it doesn't. Despite being there, 
it doesn't charge it from that. You have to use the clamps on the points here. Now we could probably install some O-rings or something like that, but ultimately you then still have this panel cover that goes over the front. I do find it a bit strange that they didn't come up with a better solution for that, but then being a VW Group product, the battery actually lasts quite a long time anyway. It's only if you're not gonna drive the car literally for a couple of months that it's a problem. Anyway, let me tidy this out of the way, get it started and we will pull it out. Check that out. That is a Glacial Blue V8 Vantage Roadster. Basically the same as mine. That was a, that's a 4.3 pre-facelift. There are some of those around, very few of the 4.7s. Completely out of the blue, how cool is that? Anyway, we're in here, we've got the fuel light on, so we're gonna go and have to rescue that, which is something that I don't normally do, to be honest. Typically, when we come back from somewhere, we fuel up the cars, so they're completely full, ready to go for the next outing. But this came back from Goodwood, having been down at the Festival of Speed at the Super Vitura Hypercar Village, and I clearly just left it be and never remembered to fill it. It's only been a couple of weeks, like three weeks at this point. But, open road, Lamborghini with a V10, and if that isn't silly, I don't know what is. This car is just hilarious. Like it might not be me in a car. I say that often, right? I'm more the SF90 type of driver in a, an elegant specification, less the bright pink Lambo. But every time you go out in this thing, it's just hilarious. It just makes you laugh because it's so stupid. It's so out there, brash, in your face, loud, obnoxious, angular, edgy, boisterous, every word you can possibly think of. And this is in STO mode, go into Trofeo, it gets even firmer and you start to get all those crackles going off behind you, which is kind of funny, but the ride is so rough. You know, I really wish I really wish that this car had, like the Aventador S onwards, an ego mode, something you could configure so that you could have Trofeo, throttle response, traction settings, feedback, heavier steering, sometimes when you want it, but still have a softer ride. Because on a road like this, which is pretty bumpy and rough, you don't want it in Trofeo mode very often. It's way too overkill. But yeah, who am I to complain? We're gonna go find a petrol station, go for a little loop on the country lanes, and, uh, Enjoy the outing in the STO. All right, we are back. Little squeeze. And I realize I do need to plug it back in and grab my phone. But I realize at this point, we've still not spoken about next door. It's coming, believe me. At least two more cars to take out, both of the Astons. GT8 first, then we can pop down the Benpack Auto Stacker and take out the Vantage Roadster. Now, I've not driven that for a while. And a few people ask, why, why do I keep it? What's the point if I'm not really going to use it? And the thing with that is it's so much more a sentimental car. It's the fact that it was the OG Schmemobile. The first time I talked to a camera while driving a car was driving that thing about what 11 or 12 years ago. It's the fact that it was my first serious sports car. It's the fact that I was able to find it again and buy it back. So it will stay in the collection proudly for the long term. It's not especially valuable. Of course, it's an Aston Martin. It's probably worth 40, 45,000 pounds, but it's more the emotional and sentimental value. Obviously, GT8 is the big angry brother, which we shall take first. So I will just get this unplugged. And one kind of funny thing that I actually have to watch out for with this is that the GT8 has a massive wing back here. And the problem with that is that it would go bang into the underside of the lift. It's a very small thing. If you know it, it's never gonna be a problem just like that, but you certainly need to be thinking about it. Then you're in here and it's about noise, noise and noise. It's absolutely ridiculous. Honestly, I don't drive the GT8 very often all that much either, but when you do drive it, it's just absolutely silly. It's really, I've spent a lot of time recently driving my other manuals, the 1M, the Amira, the Focus RS, even the Clio V6. And this is a very different car to drive. It's a challenging car to shift it correctly, to get the clutch pedal work right. And that sounds so basic to say, 
but when you get it right and you make a nice shift and then you get back on the throttle it's just absolutely perfect there's something about it that being so old school is so glorious I sound like a bro I'm a broken record when I talk about this car because every time I basically say the same things but that's how it feels I've not driven it for a couple of months the last time I took it out was with uh, Kyle from 1320 video when they came over to shoot a 1320 garages episode which was great fun to take out a couple of the cars we went out to this the SF90 Stradale and the Ford GT the Zembo was away at the time <laughs> through the paces and the big advantage of driving a car regularly like this is that you get it up to temperature you get the fluid circulating you get everything operational if you leave cars for ages what happens is all of the different seals and bits of rubber will all eventually just start to go brittle and start to destroy themselves and cars don't last like that it's the same with the tires if i know i'm going to be leaving a car sat still for months and months we'll pop it up on tire cushions because the rubber will get a flat spot and you want to avoid that but by driving all of the cars at least every whatever it is six weeks max eight weeks real uh, like limit then you make sure that that doesn't happen they're just always ready to go <laughs> oh it's it's just madness this thing's so fun i don't tend to ever do massive miles with it like the vantage roadster but every mile i do do with it it's like this just a massive smile we're back again and this is where you can see the car being parked right in the center here of the road. Imagine that at a bit of an angle. It actually looks pretty cool. We were basically having cars there for a short period and I'm not against it when it's kind of at the back of the garage because realistically, even the STO like this, that can actually come straight out. So it's only the one car you'd trap in there and really the three there, because the one at the bottom, if it's a small car, can still nip in and out, especially if that's further back. So we've got a lot of space. We've got a lot of space. Anyway, lift down, Vantage Roadster out. It is a quick swap around. Again, super easy in here. You get very used to doing that. Basically, second nature. And then, thankfully, very easy to pop open the doors. When you have the lifts down, you've got no posts in the way. You know, if you have a standard two post where you've got the regular bars at the side, you still, even when it's down, can't just open a door fully. So having the two down like this, simple super super smooth step in here get it started roof down today go take it for a run before we go out it has to be done oh that's sounding squeaky i guess it needs to be put down more often hey it's funny you can still in this car do it while you're moving Old school, memories, familiar sounds. That's what I talked about when I went to drive this for the first time after it was mine again. But yeah, out we go. After driving in the others, this is almost quiet. In fact, one of the funny things is that it only occurred to me when we were just back at the garage that we've just driven the GT500, the STO and the GT8, which I think are my three noisiest cars. Three loudest, all factory stock exhaust cars, which is quite funny because I want to take all three of those for a tunnel run back to back to back at one point. It kind of has to be done right with those just to make a whole lot of noise and enjoy motoring. But in here, roof down on a beautifully sunny day. This is a big part of what it's about. Just out for the cruise, just out for a drive, just in, enjoying the roads, chilling, not trying to do anything crazy. I mean, this car's done nearly 32,000 miles. 31 911. So you've got a caterer coming towards us. Well, that's sounding cool. Um, Yes, the 911 is arguably a bit of a competitor to the Vantage, so that's quite funny right now for that timing. But it's a car that, like I say, I don't really have any need in the future for it to be anything in particular. It's, it's just something to enjoy. It's just something to take out from time to time. I think it looks super pretty, this light blue paintwork. Obviously, after we saw the other one earlier, imagine if we had been in this one when we saw the other car um, over the sandstorm cream interior and the 4.7 NAV8. You know, and here you just drop the gears. There's nothing behind us. I mean, just slow it down for a notch. Down to second gear. Slow it down. The V8. It's not the most responsive engine. It's a bit lethargic, but it's so cool. 
it's it's a personal trip down memory lane every time I drive this car. We're back on the lift, pop the roof back on. Another successful outing in the V8 Vantage Roadster. Wait for this a second. Oh, catching my sunglasses. Wait for it, wait for it. There we go, we're done. Fly off handbrake on, car off. Perfect, ready to be plugged back in. We've had a nice little outing in four of the cars, one after another after the other. So we'll pop this back in the air and then of course the GT8 will tuck back in underneath it, but all quite easily managed, if I can say so myself. Right, let me get this back up in the air. If you've watched for this long to find out what's happened with Barn 2, Props to you, we're gonna get there in just a second. Quickly in terms of garage maintenance, car maintenance, we've got to take the LT for a service very soon. Seven years old now, seventh year service, which is quite interesting because with the cars, it effectively goes back through the service cycle to a first year after this length of time, apparently. Um, also recently, the SLS had an annual service. Obviously we try and do that every year. It's not done so many miles recently compared to what it did in my earlier part of ownership, but service and MOT, obviously the LT needs an MOT as well. Uh, not quite sure when the GT500 is gonna need an MOT. Imported it literally just shy of a year ago. Um, so normally when a car is three years old in the UK, it has to have an annual MOT from that point forwards. It's a bit confusing with this because the car isn't technically three years old, but when you import a car and do a private IBA, it gets dated the 1st of January of the year it was manufactured. So this car is officially on the paperwork registered the 1st of January, 2020, which is fascinating because they weren't yet making GT500s on the 1st of January, 2020. But there we go, you learn something new every day. So we'll see what happens with that. Obviously Amir is quite new, Vantage, we just keep running. Not necessarily a full every year service, but depending when I drive it and depending how many miles it's gonna do going forwards. Otherwise it gets a little bit crazy. 1M needs an MOT. We knew that when buying it and having now taken it over to Evolve and done the full inspection, I think it should pass with flying colors. So that should be quite easy, smooth and nice to get through as well. Everything else is all plain sailing. The GT Black Series could do with the drive. It's actually been sat for, I wanna say six weeks now, five weeks. No, is it really that long? Can't be that long. Must have been a Goodwood also. But the thing with that car, I'm not worried about it. It's a Mercedes. That could sit significantly longer. It's not sat in one spot. It's been moved for photos and things. So the tires are all good, but I'm not too worried about necessarily taking it out for a drive just for a run over because it's had so many miles and so much driving. Anyway, to the topic at hand. And the reason I have, and I apologize for this, kind of trolled you guys by waiting so long to touch on the topic is because I think lots of people have trolled me with asking the questions, because if you followed the videos, you will know that I have answered this five times by now, probably over the last 10 months or so. But after getting the keys to the adjacent space, which previously had nothing, it was the collecting yard for this milking parlor. So it was completely open, no walls, nothing, no floor, none of that. Um, about, I wanna say a year and four or five months ago, the idea was that we would use it more as a workshop, a storage space, uh, extra room, basically, if we needed anything. The long story short is, obviously, space is expensive. It's a very costly exercise doing this place. I love having the garage, having the office space, but quite frankly, couldn't justify it. So as of just shy of a year ago, I no longer have the keys or access to that space. It is occupied by another party. It is not for me at all. I have no access to it. I cannot just go and put a car in there and I have no immediate plans to have it back for anything. It makes sense financially. And when you talk about the amount of space that we have and the number of different spots that we can still fill with cars, you can kind of see that we don't exactly need it right now either. Everything is in this one hall. We've obviously enlarged the space by having the offices up top. We're going to have a workshop corner over here and we're not about to start stripping cars apart here, that kind of thing. We'll do some smaller modifications, things that are manageable within a clean space, not trying to get this place absolutely filthy. So the very long story short is that there is no barn two. It's a bit like, where is the M8? The M8 went on a rocket to the moon many, many, many years ago, but people still wonder where that's gone. Anyway, no, it just got sold. But barn two, sadly, not a thing. So there we go. If you're ever wondering, or if anybody ever asks, send them back to this video and maybe they watch 30 minutes to find out what the answer is. Thank you for your patience, guys. Thank you for your support. Like I said, I should be in California already. I just postponed my, my flights, but the good news is 
the Zenvo is in the United States. It's ready to rock and roll. There's just one more cool thing coming before I fly over, which I'm quite excited about. So stay tuned for that as well. It might involve the Ford GT, but you'll be seeing that very soon. For now though, thank you very much for your support. If you wanna see more behind the scenes, make sure to check out the subscriptions over on Instagram. I'm gonna be sharing a lot more stuff with you guys where you can be subscribed and get more access to live content and what's happening. That's it for now though. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon. Cheers.